Dr. Bart Ehrman on the Unknown Gospels. Today, we're going to be discussing his course. Make sure you sign up. MythVisionPodcast.com forward slash Unknown Gospels. We're going to be discussing the Gospels, their impact, how scholars read them versus lay people, or really even how apologists might read the Gospels versus critical historical method. I highly recommend checking out the courses so you can better understand what are these pieces of literature, what kind of genre do they fit into, and of course, Dr. Bart Ehrman is going to take a magnifying glass to this. In fact, this course on the Gospels is going to be longer and more in-depth than any of the previous courses he has done. Don't forget to sign up in the link at mythvisionpodcast.com forward slash unknown gospels. It helps Myth Vision out if you do so. And if you want to educate yourself further, I'm going to be there and I hope you are too. Dr. Bart Ehrman, welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I hope you're doing well with that COVID over there in uh, Europe. <laughs> actually, I've got, actually, I'm in America and I have COVID. <laughs> Oh, you're back. I, I had to come back. Yeah. Yeah. I had to come back. Yeah. I had to come back for a family emergency. But then when I got here, I got COVID. Oh. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Well, I hope you're recovering mild well. Symptoms. Mild symptoms. So. Well, Dr. Ehrman, if I may, you have this uh, course that we're about to launch on the unknown gospels. Well, they've been known for a few millennia. So let me give a jab at what I think you mean by this title. We've been reading these as, uh, as, as Christians, if you will, for millennia through tradition and finally, scholarship has, in the past few centuries, really parsed it out and said, hold on, something's going on in each gospel. You made the bold claim in your Genesis program, I highly recommend everybody sign up for that one, that the greatest discovery we found out is that the Bible is written by different authors. And I think you're trying to emphasize the point that there are different voices and it's not all one message. Is this idea of the unknown gospels titled that way for people to realize, like, we have not been paying attention to what these are really about? Uh, yeah, so I, I kind of like the title. Um, uh, so the, the full title is Unno The Unknown Gospels and colon, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> because people, people if they just, if I just called it The Unknown Gospels, they'd think I'd be talking about like the other, you know, the non-canonical gospels. But my, my point in the series is that the gospels of the New Testament are widely unknown in a sense. You know, the, the, the Bible is the most read book probably on the planet, and the gospels are the, probably the most read book books of the New Testament, but um, they're read not only by lay people who want to read them for their faith or to understand the world better or out of curiosity or for out of historical interest. They're also, they're also read by scholars who are interested in knowing about them, uh, really knowing about them from a historical point of view to understand them. And scholar, scholars have been studying these gospels. Of course, scholars have studied the gospels since the second Christian century, but modern scholars have been studying them since the 18th century, the end of the 18th century. And scholars have devoted themselves to understanding these books and have learned ancient languages, you know, Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew and Latin to understand them better. And they've studied the Roman Empire and they've studied, scholars have like dug into these things. Many scholars spent their entire lives doing it. And the, the tragedy is that so many lay readers who would be interested in knowing what experts have to say about it don't don't know. They don't know what scholars say. And so my my course is meant to be a, a course, uh, an eight lecture course that, that tries to present to lay people uh, on their terms what uh, what they can what, what scholars say uh, about these books. What would you say are the biggest differences in understanding how lay people just common churchgoers read the gospels and the scholars? Uh, I think there are several things. One is that the uh, the average churchgoer just assumes that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all telling the same story. They might be slightly different versions of it, but they're, they're basically, um, you know, they're telling the same, same thing. And, uh, and it's natural to read them that way because they're, they're, they're within the same book. And normally when you read a book, you know, if you've got a book that has 27 chapters, like the book has, you know, New Testament has 27 books, you read a book of 27 chapters, you don't expect chapter two to be radically different from chapter one. <laughs> if it's covering the similar material, it's got to be basically the same point of view. And that's what you read the Bible. People read the Bible that way, of course. So, and part of it is that they, they read, they'll read 
people hardly ever read all of Matthew, then all of Mark, and all of Luke, then all of John. But even if they do, they just assume that it's all, you know, saying the same thing. Um, and what scholars realize is they're not all saying the same thing. And it takes a certain way of reading them to understand that. It takes a certain way of um, knowing what these books are about and reading them as distinct. So that, that's one really big thing. And once you start seeing how they're different, it's not just that there are contradictions in these books, which there are, or that they have, you know, that they emphasize different themes, which they do. The, part of the point is, is that if you recognize that Mark is different from Luke, it forces you to understand what Mark is trying to tell you without pretending that he's saying the same thing John is saying. It makes a huge difference. It just opens up interpretation in ways that uh, people would not realize. They would just never, ever, and they never do realize. I love your enthusiasm about this. And I have an enthusiasm as well on wanting to understand these books. I was captivated like you as a fundamentalist. And then, of course, you're still in love with it, but in a different way. So if I may ask something I haven't heard anyone ask before, who are the top three scholars who have really shaped your understanding of the Gospels more than anyone else, and why were they so influential to you? Wow. Uh, I've never thought about it uh, like that. Um, you're talking about understanding the Gospels as gospel, like as, as stories, rather than understanding the Gospels as historical texts, I assume. Um uh, and you're referring to people who've influenced me that uh, other people could read, <laughs> you know, not just, um, yeah, boy, that that's a very tough question because um, I've read so many thousands of books and articles on the Gospels that uh, it's very difficult to pick three that have really changed my views. In some ways, my views of the Gospels have been a lot of it was formed in my graduate education with my graduate professors, especially a man named uh, David Adams, who completely re revolutionized my understanding of the Gospels, but unfortunately never published a book on them. Um, but he absolutely convinced me away from being an evangelical Christian who thought they all were saying the same thing to realizing that they're all different uh, from each other. And so, um, um, okay, so like Raymond Brown, major uh, major scholar uh, of the New Testament, uh, had a major influence on my, my reading of them. Um, George Werner Kummel, who wrote a standard introduction to the New Testament, was a, uh, was a, uh, a German scholar who had a major uh, effect of my uh, understanding of the Gospels, and uh, just, uh, you know, like pick someone else. There, there are, are ma many people who have written accounts of these uh, four Gospels being different from each other. Uh, for example, uh, an influential book when I was in, in um, graduate school was by a guy named Keith Nickel on the Synoptic Gospels. So, sorry, I could, you know, I could list a hundred names of influential, important scholars. Thank you so much, Dr. Emmer. I appreciate that. Look, this is more of a personal question, I guess, but do your ears perk up when someone says they're a fundamentalist or a Christian apologist while trying to make arguments about the Gospels? Like, are you anticipating them to typically make arguments to justify their faith more than using a historical critical method? Does that happen? Like, hey, um, if you know someone's an apologist and they're going to make arguments about the Gospels, do you tend to kind of have this kind of ears perk up and go, oh, gosh, what am, what am I about to hear? Does that ever happen? Uh, well, no, the thing with a, with a Christian apologist um, is that typically they, they don't tell you something you don't know or that you haven't heard a lot. And so it's very rare for me to have a discussion with a, uh, a Christian apologist who says something that other Christian apologists haven't said or that I haven't. I mean, and so um, it's so that's my experience. Usually what it means is if somebody says I'm an apologist and this is what I think about X, I, uh, I almost invariably know what's coming. Um, that doesn't mean I disrespect what's coming. Uh, or that I think I don't need to answer what's coming, or but it's uh, very very little uh, throws you for a loop. Whereas if you're dealing with a scholar who is a historical scholar who's written an article on a new aspect of the Gospels, the, they'll often will say something that you had not heard before, uh, and so it's it's a very different different thing reading historical scholarship from reading what apologists have to say. 
So this is going to be more of a blunt question. And you go into this in your courses, so make sure you sign up because this is all going to be exhaustively dealt with through the courses. Were any of the four Gospels written uh, by Jesus' direct disciples? Um, short answer, no, um, in my judgment, uh, which is the judgment of most historical scholars. Your apologists uh, will disagree, but the historical evidence uh, indicates almost certainly not. I have another course on this, by the way, that people can see. It's uh, on uh, barterman.com. It's, it's called, Did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John Write Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? <laughs> <laughs> and it, so it takes a, you know it takes a while for me to demonstrate that in fact um, there there are very very good reasons for assuming for knowing really almost virtually knowing that that these were not written by Jesus disciples they don't claim to be none of the gospels claims to be written by one of Jesus earthly followers the gospels are written in high level very educated l literary Greek by people who had uh, advanced Greek education, Jesus' closest disciples in the New Testament are lower class peasants from, uh, from Galilee who sp speak Aramaic, don't even know Greek. Um, John, for example, in the book of Acts, John, the apostle John, is said to be illiterate. <laughs> and so uh, the idea that they, they, how did they learn highly literate Greek? This is, they didn't have adult education in the ancient world. To learn how to compose books took years of training, and it started when you were a young child. And so none of the none of the disciples had that. So th that's just some of the some of my reasoning. But it it, it takes an entire course to explain it. <laughs> and they can right, check right. it out on my on my on my uh, my website. So this one also is going to get covered, I'm sure. But are there any of the gospels that are direct eyewitness accounts or literally based on eyewitness testimony, as far as you're concerned? I think, well, none claim to be, uh, none of the four claim to be. There are Gospels outside the New Testament that claim to be. The Gospel of Peter claims to be written by Peter. The Gospel of Thomas claims to be written by Thomas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there are later Gospels that claim to be, but none of the New Testament Gospels do. And none of the Gospels we have come from an eyewitness, no. That, that leads me to ask, did any of these authors really care about what really happened or would they kind of make stuff up about Jesus for other reasons? I don't think that's an either or uh, question. I don't think it's either they made it all up or it's all historically accurate. Um, I think it's like most historical sources. Uh, the gospels contain historically reliable information and they contain information that's legendary. Uh, there's both fact and fiction, if you want to put it like that, uh, in, in the Gospels. Um, but it doesn't mean that, that the Gospel writers are making it up. The Gospel writers almost certainly uh, have uh, acquired their information from other sources. We know, for example, that Matthew copied most of the Gospel of Mark into his. 93% of Mark's Gospel is replicated in Matthew's Gospel. And so he has a source of information. Um, most people who have sources of information, whether the sources are written or oral, if they repeat the story, they tend to repeat them because they think they're reliable. And so my sense is that the gospel authors believe that the, what they recounted is probably what happened. Um, that doesn't mean that they're right. <laughs> just like today, if you hear a rumor just because somebody says it and they think it's true, it doesn't mean it's true. You, can, you need to check it out. Or an urban legend or, or whatever. And so uh, so I don't think it's an either or. I do think the gospel writers thought that what they wrote, I, I think, I don't know. You know, of course, we don't know what they thought. It's hard enough to figure out what they wrote. <laughs> you can't get into their heads. And so there's no way to know. But uh, my guess is they probably thought, yeah, that, this is what happened. Very interesting. Can we understand the non-canonical gospels telling us something important about the canonical ones. As far as the genre is concerned, does, does that kind of literature kind of reflect on the canonical ones? And to follow into that, if I may, can we actually trust the canonical ones to give us more reliable information about the historical Jesus rather than non-canonical? Yeah, these are good questions. And I'll deal with the second one first. The reason for thinking that the 
canonical gospels have more reliable information largely has to do with their date and their sources. Uh, the canonical gospels probably date from 40 to 70 or 80, I'm sorry, from 40, right. <laughs> Let me get my date straight in my head. From 40 to 60 or 65 years after Jesus' death. Uh, they are by far our earliest. Our gospel writers, the New Testament gospel writers, would not have known eyewitnesses, uh, probably, but they, but they would have, uh, they would have had sources of information that had been floating around for some decades, some oral and some written, and some of that probably is historical. Once you get outside the New Testament, once you get, say, to the Gospel of Peter, now you're talking to a book that's written like 90 years, 100 years later. Uh, once you get to, you know, some of these later, most of the later Gospels are from the third, fourth, fifth centuries. And so what's the likelihood that they have reliable information that wasn't already spread about in the canonical Gospels? So uh, it's largely a matter of date um, and, uh, and the available sources at the time that make the new canonical Gospels different in a sense. Uh, but they're not different as a group per se. I mean, each one of them is different. I and mean, Mark is in a very different situation from John. I mean, Mark is probably 25 years earlier. <laughs> and so, you know, that's 25 years. And so, um, and so there are differences within them. One of the values of the non-canonical gospels is the one that you mentioned. When you realize that there are other gospels, it makes you realize that the four are not just a thing unto themselves. There were lots of people telling and writing about Jesus. That happened before our canonical Gospels. We know that because we think we know it because Luke says so. In the Gospel of Luke in chapter 1, the first several verses, Luke says that many people have undertaken to write an account of the life of Jesus. And he says that these accounts are based on what the eyewitnesses originally said and then what ministers of the word originally said. Uh, what the ministers of the word said afterwards. And so these are stories that have been passed on, first by eyewitnesses, then by then by people uh, who were leaders of churches, preaching sermons and whatnot, ministers of the word. And then people wrote them down. And he says many people did. So lots of people are writing down stories and telling stories. And the fact that we have these other gospels, we have about 40 from the early centuries, the early centuries of Christianity, about 40 gospels, some of them complete, but most of them just partial fragments that have been discovered, uh, which are the people writing accounts of the life of Jesus. Our gospels of the New Testament are four of those accounts. They're not like a group. When Matthew wrote, he wasn't planning on his book being put into a collection with Mark, Luke, and John so that you would read them as one book. He was writing his own book as was whoever wrote the Gospel of Peter, as was whoever wrote the Gospel of Judas, as was, et cetera, for, for all 45 or so of them. Uh, and so knowing these other Gospels shows us what's going on in early Christianity is that people are telling stories about Jesus and writing stories about Jesus in light of what they already think and believe about Jesus. And what they think and believe about Jesus has changed how they remember his life. Every Gospel is like that. It's very clear with the non-canonical gospels, but then it's the same thing with the canonical gospels. It's true of Mark and Luke and John and Matthew as well. These are accounts by people who have heard stories and have molded them in light of what they personally think and believe. I have recently interviewed a scholar, Robin Faith Walsh. I don't know if you've heard of her. Yeah. And her book uh, is, is an interesting one that's arguing that it seems highly sophisticated, at least in the Greco-Roman literary culture, um, the origins of the Gospels may have been written by elites competing to write different accounts. Um, she doesn't discredit the idea that there are communities behind these, but kind of like the Satyricon, it seems to be riffing off of like Peter and the, the cock crowing on the the third, you know, uh, the cock crows thrice, things like that. And there's interesting um, ideas there where the the literary corpus of what we see in the Gospels and stuff might be competitive with each other. Could that account for why Matthew's like, you know what, I like Mark, but I don't like Mark. I'm going to fix this and write a better quote unquote gospel. Are you aware of her thesis or do you have yeah. any opinions on this? Uh, yeah, no, it's it's a it's being a widely read book right now, and I think she's a very smart person. And you know, the, the way you've summarized it just now is, I think, is absolutely right. I mean, 
Luke tells us that. <laughs> Luke tells us that everybody else has written an account. Now he wants to write an accurate one. Um, and that's particularly interesting because one of his sources appears to have been the Gospel of Mark, which by implication suggests that he doesn't think that Mark wrote a particularly accurate account. Uh, and so she's taking this to a different level because she is taught she's she's well versed in uh, what was happening among literary elite at the period, and I think that she's right. These gospel writers are uh, are Christian literary elite, uh, which is one reason, by the way, they were not disciples. <laughs> They're literary elite. They're not elite in the sense that Petronicus was, who wrote, you know, the Satyricon. I mean, he's like, <laughs> he's right up there like the top, you know, half of 1%. He's way, way up. There. And the Gospels are not up that high, but they're far above the normal human being at the time. Um, and so uh, it's an interesting idea. And part of it, you know, it depends how you want to understand the relationship of these four Gospels. It's clear that Matthew and Luke used Mark. You know, is, is, is Luke competing with Matthew? Maybe if he knows Matthew, which more people are thinking now, although I'm not convinced by yet. A lot of people now are thinking that John knew Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And um, I'm not convinced by that either, but it might be right. And if so, then I think in every case that the way you summarized it is probably right. Each one is writing their account because they have a better way of doing it. Otherwise, they wouldn't write their own account. <laughs> they would write, uh, you know, they would write a, you know, they would just copy the old account. I think at the very least, one would say they know of Mark or something, at least of one account, even if you want to say Luke didn't know Matthew, but he definitely knew Mark or whatever. It's interesting to see how that plays out. But uh, one one interesting thing I've heard you say, and I wonder if this is just because consensus for the longest time placed Luke Acts in the 80s. Uh, I think you said 85 is where you usually would put that. Um, Richard Pervo in his commentary on Luke Acts and then, of course, Steve Mason he wrote a really interesting thing that I was kind of blown away with that looks like Axe knows of Josephus's writings in 93. Would you possibly push Luke Axe uh, to at least post 93 AD, maybe even later? So that is a, that is a, a move among scholars to date Axe later uh, because of its, uh, because of its, what many people think shows a connection with the writings of Josephus. Um, Pervo was a scholar of Acts and Mason is a scholar of Josephus. And so that's a, that's a strong combination. Um, I've yet to be convinced by that argument, but uh, because I think it's very, very difficult to show dependence of one author on another. I think it's a high, I consider it a high bar. Um, and to date it in the 120s would suggest that the, what seem to be quotations in uh, possibly earlier writings, what looks like from Luke uh, are not actually quotations of Luke. And so you get some of the church fathers, for example, um, who um, who may know Luke uh, before 120. But I have no screw, I have no particular problem with it. Uh, I, I uh, if, if I become convinced, I become convinced. It doesn't, it doesn't change that much uh, for me. If Acts is written in the 120s, I would say that that if it is, I, I do think Luke was written by the same author. So we put both Luke and Acts after the end of the first century. I already think that Second Peter was after the first century, and I have no qualms with thinking that Luke Acts was. Uh, it would change some things uh, in that it would actually make it um, Acts less likely to be historical in many ways and make uh, Luke problematic for other ways. But I have no principled objection to it. Bart, I have one more thing, and this gets into the Jerry Springer in the world of online YouTube. <laughs> there is a clip that uh, you particularly were mentioned on with Lydia and Tim McGrew on a YouTube channel called Testify. And if I may play just a snippet to give you a taste of the conversation, this is in regards to their whole, um, they talk about undesigned coincidences. And here we go. Right. Now, Bart clearly got caught completely w without even having looked at undesigned coincidences. And so he naturally misrepresents the argument. Again, he's a master at this. But what uh, what Lydia said when she was set this up, it, she said this word casual, right? These things are, are casual connections. That's actually the strength of the case. It's not two authors saying more or less the same thing in a similar set of words. That's exactly not what we're talking about. 
Uh, and so this is all beside the point. And of course, Bart loves to argue by the Jericho method. Instead of actually conducting an assault, he walks round and round some topic, uttering some platitudes in the hopes that it'll just fall down eventually. <laughs> okay, there you have it, Bart. What do you think about Tim and Lydia McCrew's um, maximal case for the resurrection? They even, they're not even willing to go with Gary Habermas and go with the other apologists who say, well, we're going to make a minimal facts, but they say, if you concede that little bit, you almost give it all up. So they have to die on a hill of making a maximal case. Uh, in terms of the maximal facts? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I have to say, I, I, you know, I wasn't quite sure what his critique of me was. It'd be nice if there was some substance to it. Um, uh, but, uh, okay, so, uh, you know, <laughs> it sounded more like an ad hominem attack than, like, I, so it would have been nice if he talked about some data, uh, which is uh, what I prefer doing. I prefer talking about data. And the same thing with maximalist facts. Um, it's fine to accumulate maximalist facts. Sure, that's great. You have to establish each one as being probable, highly probable. And so, you know, of course, the total maximalist fact approach is to say that everything the gospel says is true. Okay, that's the maximum. You got everything now. <laughs> and so um, the only way to proceed in a debate like that is for them to mention one of their maximalist facts and let historians evaluate it. Uh, they probably know that both with their uh, with those casual coincidences that he's talking about and his maximalist facts is that they they simply aren't are you know they're not convincing to the uh, to, to most scholars. I understand they're in their they've got this kind of apologetic thing going and they're trying to convince people who are not scholars. But how many how many bona fide scholars of the New Testament have they convinced by any of this? Um, and if they you know so uh, the only way to be convincing is to marshal data and talk about it. So if you if you happen to know uh, what some of those maximalist facts are, I'm happy to address them. I actually oh. do not want to get into all those details. I just figure I'd mention this in particular because this is the ongoing dispute. They're picking apart Mike Lacona and Gary Habermas and the minimal facts guys who are trying to make the case, and they're going, quit giving the skeptics an inch. They're going to take a mile. And it seems like, they're trying to say, no, it's all maximalist, even though we wouldn't want to put them in a camp of inerrancy or trying to uh, pretend there aren't contradictions. They'll say, yeah, there are some, but they're so they're not even important or they try to downplay the importance of these things from the from the arguments I've heard. It seems like they're still trying to once again, you know, this is true and everybody should know this is true. So what I would say is that it's, you know, it isn't that you should decide whether you want to be a maximalist or a minimalist. What you have to decide is what would be the, when, when Habermas or these others come up with their minimalist things, what they're talking about are, are, are points that most historians agree on. And there's a kind of a leverage there because they, they say, look, even people who don't believe in the resurrection would agree on this. And then once they get there, then they can start mounting their argument based on those minimal facts. If you take a different approach and you want to increase that number, that's absolutely fine. But then you're not going to be able to have that leverage because you're going to be making points that not everybody's going to agree with. Uh, and so, so you don't have that leverage anymore. And so it's fine if they want to take that approach. I have no objection. I would take the same approach to their argument that I take to any argument. You look at the data and you analyze it. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's what I would suggest they do. I suggest the audience goes and signs up for this course on the gospels. I think they're going to learn a thing or two. Um, can you plug it real quick from your own words? Like, why is this so important? Well, the gospels, uh, as, uh, as I often say, the Bible is the most, uh, widely read and revered book in our civilization <laughs> and the gospels are the most widely read and revered books in the Bible. Um, million billions of people read them and believe them uh, scholars read them uh, and scholars study them based on um, pretty advanced methods that scholars have to learn ancient languages Greek and Hebrew and Latin and Aramaic and so on and they have to and they have to uh, learn literary methods of analysis and they have to learn about Roman culture and Roman history they they, they spend their lives studying these things but the results of scholarship are rarely known among 
uh, among lay readers. And it's too bad because these scholars, they're not just people who are trying to trash the gospels. These are, most of them are believing scholars who are believing Christians. Uh, some of us are not, but we, we all are interested in approaching the gospels historically and understanding the gospels from the perspective of this kind of scholarship opens up their meaning and it shows you what they really are all about. And so it's a real shame that most people don't know what it is that scholars say. So this course is eight, eight lectures trying to show at a layperson's level what it is scholars have discovered about these gospels that can be helpful for understanding them, whether somebody is a Christian or a non-Christian, or is just interested in history or culturally interested in, knowing about this material is really important. And that's what this, this, uh, that's what this uh, set of lectures is designed to do. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Ehrman. And never forget, ladies and gentlemen, we are Myth Vision. Join MythVision's Patreon today to access hundreds of videos that I have worked hard in high quality content that are not in public domain. They're only on the Patreon. You will also have direct access to me, referring academics, questions, ideas, or just want a private chat. You have that access with me. Also, I'm trying to do more traveling to educate people from more academics and expand what kind of material I do produce on MythVision. This is a full-time gig and you're helping the community by joining. I'm trying to put together more to educate people who have harmful cultic practices or ways in which they're harming society. We are educating them from myth vision on better understanding these ancient texts and mythologies and history in a way like not many shows do. So please, I could use your help and you're going to get and benefit a lot by joining as a member.